Perfect. Hello, uh, I'm KP. I'm going to talk about the BPF LSM, uh, which is something we introduced uh, in Linux Security Summit 2019 in San Diego. It's already upstreamed. Uh, and uh, we, just because this is the last talk of the summit, we're going to hear the story of how it got upstreamed. And then we're going to walk into some technical details about this stuff. So a long, long time ago, uh, well, it was sometime back in 2019, the security analysts at Google came to me and said, we need some audit logs. Uh, I said, can't you use audit? Uh, no, audit doesn't have the data I need. OK, I, I got, I'll modify audit. I'll patch the audit in the kernel. I'll update audit CTL and all the user space stuff and all our t infrastructure that reads audit files. Mm, I want to use this data to prevent something from happening. OK, do it again for all the LSM layer. And then I just told my boss, we just need to do, we just need a new way to do security in Linux. My boss is like, oh, do it. So I said, I'll use eBPF and I'll use it with LSMs. And one of my friends here, uh, who's, who's left for the, for the talk yet, but uh, said, you should call it KRSI. And this kernel runtime security instrumentation was henceforth born. And we're off taking a plane to Portugal. Uh, I'm sitting on the bus with Alexei Starovoitov, and, he's, and Alexei tells me, uh, the only way a BPF-based LSM can land is if both Landlock and the KRSI developers work together, and they, sol they work on a design that solves all use cases. And he said, oh, by the way, KRSI is a great name. It, it's, it has got a nice rhythm to it. Uh, so we, we went to the Landlock, Landlock folks. I've personified Landlock as a lock here. Uh, Landlock says, we want unprivileged sandboxing. Uh, we, we have a discussion. This is now happening in Portugal and Lyon, uh, the Linux Security Summit. Unpri unprivileged eBPF is still quite, quite some time away, and this was reinforced by a lot of people, especially Jan Horn, who works on speculative execution stuff. So Landlock and the KRSI folks entered into a truce. We can do something else. So this is the presentation that you saw from Mikhail uh, previously. Uh, and now the battle ensued between security and the eBPF subsystems of the kernel. BPF likes performance. Tracing has always been performant. But there were discussions on the mailing list, and these are in ver verbatim from the mailing list. The LSM mechanism has never been zero overhead, and it shall never be. Uh, I don't give a flying fig. Uh, and this is my representation from the fig here. And then Alexei got tired of all of this. And on the, the next email on the mailing list, and a nervous me looking at all the list was, I think the key mistake is that we called KRSI and LSM. We should have never called that. We should have done everything in BPF. And I'm like, no, there is value to that LSM surface. Uh, we entered into a truce between the BPF and the security community. The, I call it the Treaty of Impotence, which was cited by the uh, Linux Weekly News. Uh, land the slow BPF LSMs and make all LSMs faster. So that, that, was, a, that was a good thing. It got us going in, in, our, in building our solution using eBPF, and we, we will make all the LSMs faster. And KRSI was merged as BPF LSM. Alexis said KRSI is not going to be in the kernel source code, which is fine. Like, I, didn't, I was not in particular about the name anyways. So we're going to talk about how we use the BPF LSM, uh, and what is BPF, and how does it get loaded as a refresher for everybody here in the audience. So eBPF is this bytecode, uh, which is uh, verified by the kernel. Uh, the verifier says, OK, the program can pro program halts. I have approved it for execution. It checks for memory accesses. It checks for a lot of other things, even checks for tries to check for speculative execution. Uh, it, uh, then there is a JIT, which converts this bytecode into native code. So in this case, I'm showing x86-64. And at that point, the PPF jitted code just looks like an LSM hook, as it would normally be in the kernel. So it's got all, all it can understand all the arguments like an LSM hook, it can do all the things like an LSM hook as well can. 
So uh, we use something called trampolines, which are F-trace trampolines and co in collection BPF trampolines. A lot of internals there, but it is just like another x86 native code LSM hook there. So how do you write a BPF LSM program? So you have this ELF section that says, like, I am an LSM program and I want to attach to file and protect. You, you read the, uh, the, the LSM header file and you look at, uh, you, you, give it, you give the program an example name and then you pass all the arguments. And this program currently says, I'm happy with everything, I return zero. You can use BPF helpers to collect more information there. So you can say, I want the PID. Uh, so you have a helper that says current PID TGID, uh, and then you, you can get that. But you can also do something more fancy. You can say that uh, uh, the I want to access the VMA start field of the VMA structure. And the compiler, the, the Clang compiler that compiles BPF is smart enough. It emits relocation information here in the BPF bytecode that says, hey, the program is intending to access the VM start field from the VMA struct. So whenever you load me into the kernel, please find the right offset for the VMA start field. And that is pretty cool. It makes the whole BPF program compile once, run everywhere, and portable. And then you, we also added, as a part of our LSM implementation or our security work, we also added atomics to BPF. So imagine you want to count all the unprotect calls. Uh, you, you can do like add one. And, and then you can make a policy decision. In this case, it's a very stupid policy decision. It says like you can only have 100 and protect calls in the kernel. So uh, now we're going to go to the, what is the future work that we want to do and into somewhat more uh, 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 complex areas. So this is going back to the original Treaty of Impedance that we signed. Uh, we want to improve the performance of all LSM hooks. And to understand why the LSM hooks currently have a penalty, it's because of something called indirect calls. Indirect calls are calls where you call a function pointer or essentially where the operand of the call, the address of the call instruction is not known to the compiler. The address is in a register, you load the address to register and then you call that register. And because of the, if you were here for this uh, transient execution or transient execution attacks talk yesterday, the, you can trick the speculative execution engine of the CPU to uh, speculate around these indirect calls. The speculation window is larger, especially when the address is not readily available and there is a, the CPU is just waiting for the address to be available in that register, so it starts speculating. And there is a mitigation that is called red pullines that are there for indirect calls. So what this uh, very inocular, uh, very, uh, very uh, simple sort of function pointer call looks like in the assembly is it goes to, it has this weird symbol that says call x86 indirect thunk rax. And this x86 thunk rax is actually a sequence, it jumps to a different part of your, of the kernel executable, and then it does this fancy thing. And here what it is trying to do is, it calls something called setup target. So uh, CPU starts thinking, okay, the, at this point, the, it's going to come back to this capture spec right, and it starts ru running this infinite loop in its speculative execution engine. And then it set up target, it does something clever. It moves the address in RAX to the stack pointer and does a ret instruction after that. And the speculative execution engine was trapped in thinking I'm in an infinite loop and suddenly it gets into this uh, new place. So, but all of this sequence adds overhead. And imagine all of the sequence getting added in every place where you are in socket send message or everything. So. These LSM hooks permission checks are done in very uh, in some key hot paths in the kernel, and having these indirect calls in the hot paths in the kernel is uh, is is very bad for performance. The other place where uh, there is performance impact is these empty callbacks. So BPF LSM, as a part of the Treaty of Impedance, was uh, we added uh, these empty callbacks where there are these functions. Normally, there is no BPF program attached. So you return a default value. Uh, and these are called every time on all of these hard parts, even when there's no BPF program attached. So what, how do we fix this? As it turns out that a lot of other parts of the kernel have already seen this as an issue. Uh, there is, you can look at the KVM source code. You can look at the network source code. Uh, uh, they, they don't like these indirect function pointer calls in, in these hard parts. So they've come up with uh, uh, either this, this API called static calls. 
And what happens is we, we don't need to really do the indirect call in the LSM framework because we know that all the addresses of all LSM hooks at compile time. The only reason why we do indirect calls is because the order can change at boot time. So you have this LSM equal to command line kernel parameter. And since we want that flexibility, we, 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 have to, we have to provide some dynamic ordering and that leads to a function pointer call. So what you can do with the static call API is you can have these n slots, which are initially filled with NOP instructions. And then at boot time, once you know, know the order, you can patch them with call instructions, a direct call instruction to the actual LSM hook implementation. And that changes your indirect call, which has this extra penalty to something that doesn't have a penalty here. Some implementation details. So this is for reviewers who are going to look at these patches who are going to come out on the list. We sent an RFC some time back, but we've been iterating over them, trying to measure improvements. Uh, there is this data structure called the security hook slot, which has a couple of things called key and trampoline, which are needed to define a static call. Right? There is this security hook list data structure, which has a legacy name, but I didn't bother to change that name. We could if we want that right now. Uh, this is what gets initialized by the LSM hook in it. And then there is, the, uh, there is a static key. Static key is, a, again, a, it's, a, it's a branch that, does, uh, that, that amortizes, that tells the CPU that, hey, the static call is empty. The static slot is empty. So I will change what is between that to a knob and we'll jump to the next instruction. So these are called static branches. And again, they're hot path optimizations in various parts in the kernel. So then the other implementation detail is what information gets provided by the LSM itself. So there is, it says that this is the slot I'm going to be assigned, right? These are, this is my callback. This is the LSM that I belong to. And this is the default state. The default state is kind of important for the BPF LSM because at BPF LSM, the default state is disabled. Uh, and then you have, you, you, we extended the LSM hook init macro to have LSM hook init and LSM hook init disabled, where BPF LSM would call LSM hook init disabled because initially you don't have any BPF program and only when you have a BPF program, you want to have that static key that guards the slot being active. Uh, there is some fancy macro magic that makes all of these static calls happen. So all optimizations are not free in terms of code complexity, but given that LSMs are in places where you, you really are talking about perform, uh, hard parts like sending a packet or opening a file or writing to a file, it's all, it, it becomes worth it from that perspective according, as, as per me. Uh, so you have the security for each static slot, which, is, which unrolls a for loop because, uh, and then it goes into this section which checks whether the static key is enabled and then actually does the static call. And this is essentially your redefinition of the call int hook macro, if you've looked at the LSM source code. Uh, and the, the x86 red pulling thunk RAX now changes into these direct calls. These direct calls are call to the static slot. The slot has the call instruction pointing to the actual LSM hook implementation. So it changes from an indirect call to a direct call. Uh, magically with some macro magic and some runtime patching. So what we noticed is that there's some feedback given to us initially on the RFC that we measured a syscall in a tight loop, but Redis benchmarks, there is a, a open source tool called Redis benchmark. We run this, have SE Linux enabled, and uh, we noticed that it improves performance by 10, 3%. Uh, there are some limitations for now. Uh, there are some of these hooks that don't call the call int uh, and call void hook macros. We've not gone and updated them because each of them need their separate for loop unrolling macros. We can do that, uh, but these are not yet in the hot parts of the kernel. They are typically LSM blob management hooks like secid to secctx or and, and stuff. Uh, but again, we can implement per hook macros for these as well. Uh, there is more future work here that needs to be done uh, with regards to unintended side effects. The, these default callbacks that the BPF LSM adds, we thought that they had no side effect, but they actually do end up having a side effect for corn, on some corner case reasons. So look at this uh, function called security inode set There's a comment there that says, SE Linux and SMAC integrate the 
capac, uh, capability check call. So assume all LSMs supplying that do so. Actually, BPF LSM doesn't do that. And it returns zero as a default value on the call int hook macro. And if the default value is zero, uh, the capability inode set XADA check is omitted. And what you can do is you can override security XADAs from and as an unprivileged user. But if you have SE Linux enabled, this doesn't happen. So it was not as bad as it could be. Uh, but it is, you can still vandalize the system and you can write, overwrite in security XATA and the uh, capability, security dot capability on slash user bin ping and it returns a, a non-zero error code, which is how we notice this. This is reported by Jan Horn uh, internally. So, we need to fix these side effects and we sent a patch to try to fix that. Uh, the, the, the bottom line is that this LSM red default in this default callback can lead to subtle corner cases. This was not the only issue we noticed. Uh, this was pretty serious, uh, the most serious one we noticed, but there were other side effects that we noticed is sec ID to sec CTX default value actually broke audit, right? Uh, I note copy X at a similar case where we returned a default value that was incorrect caused crashes. So few ideas, the few ideas, uh, we could have a new error code that is E no decision, uh, or use an existing error code that signifies that, hey, I'm an LSM and I don't have a decision to make given the information I have. This is helpful if also if you're in a BPF program and you're only doing auditing uh, and you want to return a value uh, and say, okay, I'm, I don't want to bother with a policy, policy decision or I don't have the right information for a policy decision. Uh, so, or you could use static keys to enable or disable LSM hooks, which the proposed patch for performance improvement already does, but it doesn't solve the BPF program returning uh, 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 e-node decision case where it's only, it's only going to do audit. I mean, you could look at the code more carefully. You're, you are crafting an LSM at this point, right? So you should be more careful, but we made mistakes even though we were trying to be careful. So it may be better to fix it at a systemic level here. Uh, the other future work that is going on currently is uh, program sig signatures. So we want to sign BPF programs and there's going to be a boff later. We're going to discuss uh, BPF program signatures and IMA. Uh, but the, the thing that we want to make sure or the goal is that you're compiling a BPF program. That build chain for your BPF program is trustworthy. I can trust where this BPF program is coming from. There is... A, there is a dilemma here that you can't really sign that object file that you generate at compile time. And this is because we, because this libbpf that, uh, that is you, because you're accessing struct fields and they're modified at runtime, you're setting up all these maps, the actual instruction buffer gets modified and your signature changes. Your signature is not stable there. So if you try to verify that signature in the kernel, you're going to get a different signature. You're going to, uh, verification is always going to fail if you, if you do that. So this was uh, BPF folks tried to solve this. They, they uh, implemented something that is called a loader program. A loader program is actually the trace of all the operations that are performed by libbpf. So the instructions of this loader program is the instructions that, are, that represent all the syscall operations and then the instructions of the original program itself. And the overall instructions loader is then stable because all these modifications then happen in the kernel as, a, as this as BPF loader program there. So you can sign that instruction blob there. BPF syscall doesn't know about your file at all. BPF syscall only knows about the instruction buffer. There is no file argument to the BPF syscall there. So how does this look like? You have the program, the loader program, the signature, uh, and then you can, in the BPF prog alloc, you can write this ls LSM gatekeeper program, which is again a BPF program, but you can have this BPF program be a part of the kernel itself or loaded and is in, in a trusted stage. Uh, and then there is an, there's uh, people on the BPF mailing list. This is currently, uh, we're trying to implement this BPF helper that is BPF verify BKCS7 signature. Uh, so this, the LSM gatekeeper program can also have more runtime policy information. I was trying to understand from the key uh, keychain talk as well, but this is where you can sort of have a runtime policy. You can say that BPF trace, which generates BPF programs at runtime, uh, this is the allow listed hash for that, that can 
run unsigned BPF programs there or signed by a different key or something. That, that's where your flexible policy gatekeeper engine sort of lives, like, lives uh, in, in the kernel. Uh, okay, so, yes. That, we, we, we will do another boff and I, I, I'm just running short on the uh, future work number four. And this is the Exciter support. Again, that BPF trace use case, we want to just allow BPF trace to lower BPF programs. This is very heavy prototyping going on. The, the Exciter patches are on the mailing list right now and there is no, uh, the domain information or whatever. We It's just a, an example that we cooked up for this uh, talk. Uh, so simple domains, uh, BPF domain security.bpf exciter can load BPF programs and exciter security uh, security.domain equal to exciter can load, can set extended attributes. Uh, and then you can sort of see that like exciter minus L user bin BPF trace is security.domain BPF, right? And then you have, we've added a new helper to the kernel that is the BPF get exciter helper. Uh, which allows you to read extended attributes from files, and you can use this in different parts of the kernel on all of the LSM hooks. It need the, 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 you need to be using sleepable BPF programs, but I go into implementation details. Uh, so the LSM hooks that you can use there are the BPRM committed creds hook. Uh, uh, you read the extended attribute from the executable, and then you store the uh, security domain information in the task blob. The task blob, we've added helpers to BPF to implement security blobs, which we call BPF local storage. So you can say BPF uh, task storage get, and then you can set a, uh, your custom enum, whatever domain you want, and you can set that information there. Uh, in the task alloc hook, when a task is forking or a new or a child task is being formed, you can transfer the security domain, domain information to a child, or you can do even more complicated things where you don't want to transfer this information there. Uh, in the BPF proc LSM hook, you can deny BPF syscalls for any non-BPF domain tasks. Uh, and in the inode set exciter hook, you can deny uh, attempt to set extended attributes from outside the exciter domain. OK, so that was my talk. I think I finished on time uh, with room for questions as well. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh huh. Yes, I think the, the the these hooks that we've added, we call them no side effect hooks, but they're really not. If the LSM framework changes in a subtle way, you end up having a side effect in some corner case, and then it's either like uh, angry developers or angry bots who find this and they uh, it breaks functionality. Yes, yes. So if you had a group of stacking, like there is only one error that book that could possibly run in this situation, where is the most likely reference coming from? Then maybe BPF trace. Like, oh, maybe the BPF that was running all the way from, and that's how I figured that out. Yes, I think we, we proposed an initial implementation where the LSM was guarded by static keys. Uh, uh, but yeah, that was, that, that was, we didn't want anything in the LSM. We decided that we don't want anything in the infrastructure that is guarded by a static key. So we ended up implementing these default hooks. But we, we need to have this. This hook shouldn't run by default. There is no default hook that has no side effect. Or we update the infrastructure to handle no decision case for default hooks. Thank you. We will fix the bug. We should fix the bug. <laughs> So we uh, we have now the, the, the so I that the, the organization I come from was we have a, a tele, an agent that was using a kernel module and, and com combination of kernel module and audit logs to send telemetry information from our internal machines uh, like laptops and we changed that that agent to instead of using kernel module and audit to use our BPF programs so now we are using BPF programs for that we've rolled it out for for all our machines right now. No, I, I think this is this was a couple of slides that I had in backup. Is that while I say that we do we, uh, 
uh, mandatory access control and LS and auditing need to go together. They actually don't because sometimes you want to do a policy check really early on and you want to do an audit really late in the in the life cycle. So we would ideally, if we come up with an agreement that the LSM security equals to access control plus telemetry or plus information, then we can add new LSM hooks. But uh, And we have a few use cases where we would like to propose new LSM hooks as well. Thank you.